So uh, welcome both to our audience here at the Centre Court MBA Festival in DC and of course everyone that's uh, joining us on the uh, live stream. I think that uh, the last uh, event that we had in London, we had 38,000 of, of you following us from around the world. Not, not that any pressure on you guys to <laughs> say the right thing. Um, and of course, uh, Centre Court is all about meeting uh, the top uh, US and uh, international business schools. So uh, uh, in today's admissions and uh, careers panel, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Colleen Stanfer, who is um, a recruitment manager for HEC Paris. Colleen, thanks for joining us. And uh, Brett Twitty, who is the director of admissions for exec format at uh, the Darden School. And of course, Brett, Darden gets closer and closer to DC. Now you're just across the river, right? So um, perhaps I can start with you, um, just uh, Brett, as we look at, um, uh, at a changing uh, market for, for top schools like Darden and the sort of trends that you've seen in the last two or three years. Sure. Um, first of all, thanks for being here. Um, I realize it's opening day for baseball and also uh, NCAA tournament. UVA is playing later tonight, but does not include this year. So uh, in terms of trends, I think like many U.S. based schools, uh, we've seen a decline in volume overall, but quality remains very good, so that's always a positive. Some of that is the counter-cyclical nature of admissions when you look at it relative to the overall U.S. economy, so as the economy is good, typically fewer people will look to go back to school. Um, in addition, some of the international um, market disruption that we've seen, perception of the U.S. abroad, uncertainty about visas after graduation has affected us, like many other U.S. schools, but overall I think we feel good about where we are with our app applicant pool, but it's uh, every year is a new year and presents new challenges. Right. And, and we talk about that, that, that cycle of the market, you know, when, when uh, applications go up 6% one year and they drop by 4% the next. Um, the, the, the essence, though, is there is always a core of really talented individuals that look at business school, at top schools like Darden, um, and, uh, and, and the idea that this is a, a great next step for them, right? So uh, really, we're looking at the longer term picture. That's very true, and I think the other thing that we think a lot about, I mean, to Matt's point, is, okay, so there's the overall volume, so how many people are applying, but is the quality there? Are we seeing the kind of candidates that we want to see? Are we seeing people that we think can be very successful at Darden, which is an academic question, it's a cultural question, it's who you are as a person, what you'll bring to the classroom, and uh, so far this year, it's felt like a great year. Right. So it's been a um, politically uncertain year or, or two. You can hear from my British accent what, uh, what I might uh, pick up on the news every time I open the BBC. Um, Colleen, in terms of uh, top European business schools, in the last two, three years, um, you've actually seen a, a real uptick. Yeah. What are you seeing? Um, yeah, actually, uh, first of all, thank you also um, for, for being here and for, for having us. So it's a pleasure. Um, we actually have seen an increase in applications uh, overall over the last couple of years. Um, an increase in applications from the United States as well. Um, candidates from the United States that are interested in kind of pursuing a more international MBA, um, a more diverse MBA. Um, and so when you're looking at European schools, we've seen uh, a, a growth in interest as well. Um, we have a lot of candidates that are interested potentially in making that transition to kind of a global, a global career, a global market. And so we do have um, actually an increase in, in, on our side. Right. And, and as we look at or listen to some of those politics, there's a lot of noise, but we've often accused globalization being as, you know, being responsible for all evils. Um, but the reality is, of course, business school and, and looking at, you know, top programs like HEC Paris, it's actually a great opportunity to, to, to achieve that sort of international experience that would be a real value add on your resume. We, we, we really think so. And we see great success with our students actually um, making that transition into, into a real global kind of career. We see recruiters also that are interested in these kind of globally minded candidates um, that have real international exposure that actually enhances your overall ability to be competitive in a global market. Right. Right. Um, in terms of selectivity, of course, you have data points, and you know, in recent years, we've seen uh, GPA averages to get into these top schools continue to nudge upwards and GMAT scores that, that go with them. Um, but at its heart, at a school like Darden, obviously, and its focus on the case method, when you're looking at candidates and that sort of sense of how they fit with a program, alignment, how do you weigh the data points with other aspects of their profile? Sure, it's a great question. So the way I encourage candidates to think about the numbers is first of all, don't look at our average, look at the sort of middle 80% of the class, 
and understand that standardized test score, undergraduate GPA, uh, will only get you in a mix of people that we're considering for admission. We'll obviously invite anyone for an interview that we're considering for an offer of admission, and that is really a chance for you to share who you are, for us to get to know your story, why you want to pursue an MBA, why you specifically want to come to Darden, uh, what your career goals are post-MBA, and really, in some ways, make a case for yourself um, at, at this particular school. So, um, in how we think about someone who can be successful at Darden, particularly since it is a case method school where you are learning by discussing business cases, you're put in the position of a C-suite leader in an ambiguous situation with incomplete information and you have to make a decision and articulate that decision to your classmates and explain the why. That has not that much to do with your test score, right? Uh, it has a lot to do with how you relate to other people, how, how you think critically, how you ultimately express yourself. And so test score, undergraduate GPA, Certainly part of the picture, but far from the, the whole picture. Right. Now, Colleen, I didn't need to spend two hours in um, the line waiting at Dulles Airport last night to be reminded just how international uh, DC is. Uh, but for a school like HEC Paris and other top uh, European schools, as you're looking at those sort of qualities, um, how, how important is it that you've had um, significant international experience? What, what is significant international sure. experience? Great, that's a, a good, really good question. Um, especially when you're looking at a program like HEC, um, our MBA is 92% international. So of course we have our French participants in the program, but we are really looking at a very, very diverse cohort. Um, so what we're looking at actually in your profile is if you've lived abroad, amazing. If you've had a study abroad experience formally, also amazing, but not everyone has actually had the chance to live abroad or, or had that study experience abroad. So we're looking at key uh, indicators in your profile that you can actually succeed in a diverse environment. So maybe your headquarters is abroad, maybe you are working on an international team, maybe your boss is from London. Um, anything that you have actually in your background that kind of shows that you're interested in an international environment and that you are actually able to succeed when you're challenged by people who think differently than you is really important. Um, how important? It's one of the elements that we're looking at, of course, in your profile. Um, with such a diverse program, it is something that we are um, measuring, but it always is measured, again, among all of the other elements that you're submitting in your, in your application. Uh, someone once commented, Brett, that when you've done 320 case studies at Darden, you're pretty much ready to land on your feet in, in any industry sector um, coming out of uh, business school. But, you know, great general management education. How important is it to then sort of um, identify some of the core strengths with a faculty, uh, recruiter relations that you have? How, how can that influence the personality of the school? So, this is about your career, right? This you go get an MBA, certainly because you're interested in the education and the educational experience, the wonderful people you'll meet, but it's undeniable that you are choosing to pursue this degree in pursuit of an ultimate career outcome. So you absolutely should look at any school and say, where are those people going to work? You know, how much are they earning? Does the ROI make sense for me personally, short term? And also think about the long term. I think there is a lot of transactional thinking. What's that first job I'll get? And really, it's a network for life. It's a training and skill set that will serve you much longer than three to five years after your graduation. And that's ultimately how we also encourage candidates to think about it because we like to think, you know, you're a Darden alum for a much longer period of time. You will shape your classmates' experience well after you've graduated. And obviously you contribute to the school in a lot of different ways beyond just for the two years that you're in Charlottesville. Now, of course, it's tempting to think that everybody in France uh, sells luxury high-end handbags and perfumes from Louis Vuitton and uh, Hermès, some of them. Um, and of course, luxury is one area that your school is very well known in. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's much broader than that. Can you talk perhaps more about the European sort of landscape and opportunities uh, across different industries? Sure. Um, so, indeed, we are very well connected with luxury brands, um, being that we're very close to Paris. Um, we though see this as a kind of a niche. Um, it's not something that most of our students are trying to, to, to break into. We do have some interest, but it's not the majority. Um, otherwise, I think that what you're looking at is a, a, a climate where there's a lot of interest in innovation. There's a lot of interest in innovation, digital, um, entrepreneurship as well. Specifically at HEC, we do see this across sectors. So regardless of what your previous MBA experience is, this is kind of the trend that we see among our uh, current student population, for sure.
Right. Um, many of us, you know, four or five years out of school, our resume has worked for applying for other professional positions, and now it's the chance to apply to business school. So, Brett, do you read the fun stuff at the bottom of a resume first, or are you looking through, uh, starting with academics and work experience? I definitely pay attention to hobbies and interests. Um, one of my favorite resumes from last year, yes, in admissions we do sometimes have favorite resumes, uh, just included what the person had read recently. I'm a big reader. I like keeping up on, you know, what other people are reading. I thought it was an interesting conversation point when I actually met him in person. Um, so understand that there's place for that in the application process. We want you to be your authentic self, and it doesn't mean just this resume that talks only about what you've done professionally, but make some space for the things that you're really passionate about in, in addition to your work experience. So, absolutely. Is, is there a danger sometimes that resumes can be too technical or, you know, use the, the language that is specific to the industry that we work in? For sure. So, uh, we obviously recruit pretty heavily here in the Washington, D.C. metro. There are a number of people who have jobs that are technical in nature. There's a lot of acronyms in this world. There's also a lot of jargon. So. It would be good for you to make sure that you translate your resume to make sure that as a lay audience, you know, certainly admissions officers have seen people from a broad swath of industries and backgrounds, make sure it's clear to you how you've had, clear to us how you've had impact, what you actually do in your role, how you contribute to the organization and your team. Um, so jargon free is generally advisable. Now, uh, Colin, if you think about people that you'll be meeting at Center Court tonight, one thing we can be fairly confident of is that they don't have an MBA. That's why, that's why they're here and, and talking to you. Um, so, you know, we talk to them about transition and a life-changing experience and all of these you know, wonderful things. Alumni uh, you know, share those sort of experiences. As you look at those that you've met and, and have been through the application process to the same individual that you see a year and a half, two years later, what do you think are some of those you know, major factors, the real transitions that they go through? Yeah, so I think that there is... Uh, a huge transformation that takes place through the whole MBA journey. It actually starts with the application though. So the application is where you're actually making that kind of reflection on your career and why are you seeking an MBA. So it starts with you. But then the MBA process itself really does offer you a huge transformational opportunity. For leadership, I would say, is one of the most important things that you're really getting out of an MBA. Um, many students who come to an MBA have already had, you know, some leadership experience, whether it be at work or um, back in undergrad or in their personal hobbies. Um, so that is really important to see on, on, the, on the CV, on the resume, but it is uh, something that we see develop extraordinarily during the program. Um, in our program specifically, we have lots and lots of leadership opportunities that are actually built into the curriculum. Um, so I would say that the leadership component and the ability to be kind of transversal across um, different areas of business is one of the main kind of takeaways um, from an MBA. Yeah. Now, at HEC, um, MBA classmates, they're going to spend 16 months with a very talented, a very diverse, a very open-minded, ambitious group of classmates, and they could end up doing something wildly different from what they shared with you uh, in that application. Now that's okay, right? It's, so, so what are you then looking for in terms of uh, a maturity or sort of a self-awareness in the application yeah. itself? So um, of course when we're looking at your application and we're looking at your MBA plan, we're trying to see if it's coherent. Can our program help you achieve your MBA objectives? So it's important to have your objectives clear. Are we expecting that you know the exact company that you want to work for? Definitely not. Do you have to know the role that you will assume after the MBA? Also, not necessarily. Some people have that very clear. Um, some people have that very clear, get to the program, and within two weeks realize that that was not at all what was for them. So we do see that um, quite, quite often. The important thing, I think, uh, in looking at those kind of cases is having support of the careers team at any school. So the careers team is really there to support you through that journey. Uh, they really want you to find your job. Not the job of the person sitting next to you in class, not the job that your father had, not the job of your aunt who lives in London. We want to know what is your ideal job, what is your ideal journey post-MBA, and we're going to try to help you identify that and build yourself during the program so that you can actually achieve what it is that you really want to do. Brett, I once had the privilege of inter interviewing um, your, your former dean, Bob Brunner, uh, and he said, um, when asked about where uh, one of his MBA students might head next, he said, well, where can you do your best work? Is that something that you bear in mind as you look at applicants and the sort of uh, career plans that they share? Yeah, I think 
we're always looking at, does this make sense, what this person is telling us in terms of where you want to go next? Um, but you're also trying to judge people coming into what's going to be a transformational experience, right? An MBA program uh, is designed to fundamentally enhance your strengths, change maybe how you think about the world, broaden your view. You're going to learn tremendously from the people in the classroom, the faculty you have, and so it's not entirely fair for us to say you need to know exactly what you need to do, but there needs to be a certain logic to it. And then what we really want to see you do is pursue what you're passionate about. Business school does a tremendous job of getting you to realize very quickly what you're great at and what other people are better than you at. And it's humbling, absolutely, um, but that gives you a focus and then you can think, where should I go next? The other thing I would say that's very challenging in business schools is that you all of a sudden learn about a million things that you didn't know about. There are employers coming on campus, they want to talk to you. Spend some time now doing that self-reflection, having informational interviews because the more focused you can be, at least open but focused at the same time, the easier it is when all of that starts to happen. You don't feel like you have to follow the herd and go to every company briefing because you have a plan um, and know that you're not alone on this journey either. So you have alumni, you have second year students, you have your classmates, um, you have this whole broad network. Now 10 or 11 years ago, pre uh, Lehman Brothers collapse, um, some of the business schools were placing 45, 47, 51% of uh, the class into financial services. Those days have gone. Uh, the consultants have certainly stayed around, and now Amazon is uh, building one of their second headquarters just down the road here and has talked about hiring 50,000 people in the coming years. As we look at the skill sets that you need, it can be very difficult to predict five years out, ten years out. Is it healthcare? Is it fintech? So what do you think are the fundamentals that uh, business school can really then share to help you navigate your career? So the thing that I think about as being immensely helpful for anybody who wants to work in any of those careers is to be comfortable with ambiguity. To be able to look at a situation, you don't have all the information, you're moving into a largely unknown space, you think about any tech startup, you're doing something that's never existed before, you're trying to solve a problem that people have not been able to solve. You have to be comfortable with ambiguity. All senior level decision makers ultimately are probably making decisions off of the best information they have, which is not perfect information. Um, communication skills, the ability to directly communicate what you are thinking and not only what you're thinking but why and to be mindful in that communication to understand the people you're speaking with and what their perspectives may be um, as they hear what you're saying. Um, and I think any business school ultimately is trying to give you a framework for unpacking information. That's certainly true at Darden. I mean, one of the reasons why we think that there is a, there's a stickiness to what you get here beyond just technical information is ultimately because you're trained to think. And you're trained to think critically in a very structured way. So somebody hands you a new case on the first day of school or the 300th plus case at the very end of school. You're looking at a new industry, new problem, but you have an approach. And so ultimately, those problem-solving skills are some of the most fungible aspects of, of, of your time in, in an MBA program. Now, it's a considerable investment in time, uh, financially. Uh, Colleen, when you're talking to people that sort of say, you know, I don't, I don't know if business school is right for me. I mean, certainly, Brett, you're making the case that there are fundamental skills that will then serve an individual through whatever uncertainty and the career that they then navigate. How do you help them to understand if, if, if business school is right for them? Uh, so I think the, one of the most important things that we do is we get to know you actually before you apply to the program. We are available to help you. We want to know you before you're actually applying so that we can help guide you and help make that decision. Because as you said, Matt, it is a huge investment in time. It's an investment in money. It's an investment in your personal life. Um, it's an investment. It's taking a chance, right? Uh, but it is that. It's taking a chance. It's a risk. And so we try to help you see, okay, is this, is this a smart idea for you? Is this a, um, a program? Is HEC a program that's going to help you achieve your long-term career objectives? And the answer might be yes. And the answer might be no. I mean, it's really dependent on you. It's so individual, um, this whole process, the whole process of an MBA, that we really want to help you have clear uh, whether or not the program is a good fit. So that's the other thing is fit. Uh, each program, I think each MBA program that you're looking at, it's really, really important to get to know that specific program, to see if it is offering what you need and what you want out of your MBA. Um, so 
I would say, um, yeah, I, I think it's really that. It's connecting with the schools, connect with alumni, uh, connect with current students. All of those things will give you lots and lots of information about whether or not actually this is a good next step for you in your career. Okay, now, uh, connecting with alumni, we've talked about how LinkedIn can be a great tool, obviously, to find Darden MBAs, HEC Paris MBAs, or from other schools. Um, but uh, do you help to also facilitate those discussions? Because sometimes those requests on LinkedIn go unanswered people leading busy lives. How, how can you help create those connections? Actually, yes. So with our team specifically, we are traveling all over the world um, for our recruiting efforts, and we do host events in, in your city. So when we are traveling to New York, when we're traveling to DC, um, we are actually able to invite you to join us in events where you have uh, alumni actually present. Um, and that is one way that we can help you facilitate your kind of the knowledge that you're gaining about, about the program specifically. Reaching out on LinkedIn sometimes can work, so that can be um, you know, a, great, a great initiative that you can take. I don't know how um, often, if you're sending kind of generic messages though, those will be answered. I think the more implicated you are in your search with a specific school and the more specific your questions are um, and the more um, tailored your questions are, the higher chances that you'll actually be able to kind of have some feedback um, on, on that side. Darden has some fiercely loyal alumni, I'm sure, but you'd love to think all of them uh, will respond. But uh, yeah, any additional advice to reaching out? Um, so I would say as a prospective MBA student, you do have a unique standing in the world. There are a lot of people who just want to talk to you about their experience and help you along because uh, at least the culture at Darden, and I think in many places is, you know, someone helped me, I want to help someone. And that's sort of pay it forward, pay it back. And you know, people love giving other people advice, right? And here's what you should think about. Here's my experience. Um, you know, buy someone a cup of coffee and just say, can you tell me a little bit about what Darden was like or what your particular MBA program was like? What advice would you have for someone who's in my situation? What should I be thinking about? That's a very easy ask for someone. Uh, it's not super transactional. It's really a pretty easy conversation for any alum. Now, every nine or 10 years, uh, application numbers falter at the, at the top schools. Uh, and so in the media, they talk about you know, the MBA in crisis. And then the next eight, nine years, it's you know, more growth and more great stories for, for individuals. So if we look at this cycle, um, of course, the MBA is now a, a part of a portfolio of programs that uh, business schools uh, offer. Uh, HEC is, you know, has some of the best pre-experienced masters in management, masters in finance. Uh, Darden, you also offer at the other end of the scale your uh, global executive MBA program. Uh, we're seeing masters in business analytics. Brett, where, where do you see the MBA within what business schools offer in the next five, ten years? Well, I mean, personally, I, I say this as someone who works uh, with working pre professionals primarily, so people who are working while pursuing their degree. That seems like a, an area where, not speaking specifically for Darden, but just MBA programs generally will continue to try to offer MBAs for people who can't take two years off, who want to continue to advance their career, work in a job while pursuing their MBA. So whether it's part-time, evening, weekend, I don't think we've hit market saturation on, on that yet. Uh, certainly this is the era of the specialized masters, so people trying to think about, if you don't want to go with the more general training that an MBA offers, what you know, in terms of our faculty and our expertise, what can we leverage to give you a may maybe a more sp specific skill set? Um, so now we have a master's in business analytics, which is a very interesting program. It's actually a joint program between Darden and the Undergraduate School of Commerce at the University of Virginia. So I think obviously one of the real strengths of any MBA program, certainly a place like Darden, is, is the strength of the faculty and all the expertise that's there. And, the, the MBA is just one way to get it in front of people. There are so many other ways, and I think schools will continue to think creatively about how they can leverage their faculty, their alumni, their resources to, to serve you know, the needs of, of a, what we see to be a very strong, strong pool of candidates. Right. Uh, Colleen, of course, HEC has also worked with Coursera to offer a master's in, uh, what is it, entrepreneurship and, and innovation, innovation and entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship. Um, but when you then talk to students about actually spending 16 months, two years together, and not just in the classroom, right? It, it's all of the things that happen outside, the you know, clubs, treks, you host the MBA tournament of all the top European business schools. H how does that play into the experience? Um, this is extremely important in the MBA experience. So um, as Brett has mentioned, it is super important to understand well the faculty of the institution that you're going to be joining. The academic component of an MBA is really the, the 
um, the seeds of the MBA. So this is really important. Everything that comes outside of your academics, though, is also equally important. As I was mentioning earlier about your career, um, your career development and your leadership development, this is extremely important. What we try to do during the MBA is, though, to give you many opportunities to hone these skills. For example, the MBA tournament is the Olympics of the MBA world. It's hosted by HEC, it's our event, and it's a student-run event. Um, so there's always a big election that takes place at the beginning of the term um, to elect the MBAT planning committee. Um, we see this as a really good opportunity for you to do two things. One is to really get real experience leading a large project, um, if you've never especially had the chance to do so. The other is that it's a big, heavy investment in your time, but it's low stress because it's not actually a job. So we're really happy to be able to offer you these kind of opportunities during the 16-month program where you're really able to get a lot out of um, your extra activities. We have also 40 student clubs um, that you can get involved in. I think every school is going to have some kind of business-related um, business clubs, private equity club, consulting club, etc. Um, I think a lot of our students, though, are very happy that we also offer clubs like Wine and Cheese Club or the French Connection Club, um, things that really make you feel that you're connecting with the, the French culture while you're, while you're living in France. Um, so you do have lots and lots of opportunities to develop yourself outside of, the, outside of the academic and outside of even the professional side. It's also personal development that you'll be offered during the program. So there's a French business school that offers a wine and cheese club. I just don't see the connection on that one. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we talk about the leadership skills that might emerge through, you know, organizing these events. Do you worry about what recruiters are looking for, about, you know, the tech giants that are, you know, sweeping up great numbers of applicants, the consulting firms? And are you in a dialogue with them, Brett, to find out the skills they're looking for? Yeah, so we obviously communicate very closely with our career development center colleagues at Darden. We also have a corporate advisory board that helps us think about how we continue to prepare students for for their careers. Again, you know, MBA is a tremendous training, tremendous education, but it's also in service of, of a career um, and helping you build a career. And so we talk to a lot of different people and obviously Darden has incredible alumni who are extremely engaged with the school and they feel very comfortable speaking up and saying, hey, this is what I'm seeing at my particular company and this is an opportunity for the school. This is an opportunity for graduates. You might want to think about this. Colleen, similar sort of relationship and feedback that you get? Absolutely. We have our careers team, which also has a corporate outreach team. So they're in contact with the large recruiters that are um, recruiting MBAs. Um, there's lots of events also that are hosted actually on campus that are organized by the Career Center um, with, these, uh, with these expectations in mind. So um, the events that you'll see, I guess, with recruiters on campus will change over time. It changes with the market. It changes with what, um, with what our students are asking for, but also with what the recruiters are expecting. Right. Now, beyond Centre Court and my role with Fortuna, I talk to I know, two or 3,000 applicants to the top business schools every year. Uh, and we have conversations, and maybe 20, 25 minutes in, they say, well, um, let me share this with you, but this is not something that I intend to tell the business schools. I always wonder what's, what's going to come next. Um, <clears throat> but it often talks about failure. Now, whether it's in our resumes, whether it's in the essays that we send you guys, uh, what we hope that recommenders, everything tends to focus on success. I was great in this. I achieved this. You know, here is quantified results. Is there a place for failure in your resume, in your essays, even coming from recommenders and what you did with it? Brett. I, you know, I, I saw this question beforehand and I, I will say I, I thought about it in terms of where you might talk about it in our application and how you might think about bringing it up. There's no doubt that Darden is hard, it's challenging, uh, business school is hard and challenging. You're going to have, you know, some struggles along the way. You're going to have setbacks, whether it's in the classroom, it's in the career search, and we're ultimately interested in understanding how you respond to that. Um, everybody will tell you, I mean, that's just part of the growth experience. And so knowing that you already have the skills in place, that you've battled through some things matters. Um, certainly it's fodder for interview conversation. Um, you know, I think there's plenty of space there. Um, there's not necessarily an essay in our application that specifically speaks to it, but I believe it was mentioned in the previous panel. There's always a, sort of an optional essay or additional comments section, which is really blank space. It's an opportunity for you to share anything else with the committee that you think would be relevant to the consideration of your candidacy. 
And the nice thing about that is it can be whatever you want it to be. So if you've had adversity, if you've had to battle through some things, maybe your undergraduate record or career choppiness, but you found your footing and you are where you are because of that experience, it's a tremendous opportunity to share that. And so think about your narrative, what's important to you and what you really want to get across to our committee. And if that's part of who you authentically are, then definitely find a way to get it into both maybe your application as well as your interview. Right, so we're not talking uh, you know, about a catalog of failures, but you know, Colleen, uh, failure as, as, as a positive learning experience, if you have that blank page and the opportunity, can you see how that would actually uh, help you to better connect and understand this applicant and possibly even endear you to him? Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, with failure, so failure is something that everyone struggles with. Everyone has had failures in their life. Um, so there's no denying it and you can't hide it. Um, we are aware of that and we are okay with that because we want to know about you. Um, we want to know who you are. We want to know your story and failure is going to be part of that story. So maybe it was a failed startup, um, but maybe your next startup or your second, third, fourth, fifth startup will take off. Um, that's often the case. So failure doesn't mean that you won't be successful. Failure means that you have tried. And the important thing is to keep trying. Um, and so we are looking for that in your application. We're looking for the human side of you. Um, so there's no, harm, there's no harm in that. We just want to know um, a little bit more about you. Like we've mentioned, you have that extra essay um, in our application as well where you can kind of develop on, on that if you, if you so choose. Um, but don't be afraid of telling us the things that you've tried. So don't be afraid of trying to ask the panel questions. I've got one more question, but I think you probably have more interesting questions at this point than, than I do. So, uh, yes, the young, young man at, uh, at the front, if, um, if we can pass a mic, it could be mine, uh, or another one that's available to us. Unless you have one of those booming voices that projects. Actually, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, my name is Darren Williams, I am a consultant, um, and in my MBA journey, I'm looking for a pivot. I am interested in uh, a few different things, and I'm honing in on exactly what that would be. You spoke to having an understanding or being able to have a, a thread to what it is that you'd be looking for afterward. Um, how have you viewed applicants in the past who may not have an ex exact target, but they have a couple of things that they are interested in? Is it something that you think should be articulated? Um, it, would that be helpful, it, even if it's not one specific area that they could speak to, you know, why they're interested in, you know, a couple of different things. Yeah, so um, the first thing I think of is, you know, it would be critical for us to understand why you're passionate in, about these particular next steps. Even if you say, oh, these two or three things, you know, what is it about your past experience, your personal professional experience that has led you to this conclusion? Uh, also, what have you done to sort of engage these ideas, right? So have you talked with people in your network, colleagues, peers, alumni, you know, of our school, of any other school, and said, hey, look, this is my background. I'm interested in what you do. Tell me a little bit about what advice you might have for me. Um, so that kind of informational networking can be particularly valuable um, if you're looking to make a big career switch because, or even a sort of modest pivot because the big question that you want to be certain of if you're going to embark on an MBA is, is this the step that you need to take to get to that next thing? And they can help you think through that. If the person has an MBA, doesn't have an MBA, maybe has seen how both types of training and background play out, I think it will, it's that particular work, I think there's a tendency to think of networking as something that you might do a little bit later in the process. Once you start in a program, do it now. Have those informational conversations because it will help you be clear about your intention to pursue an MBA. I think I'd just add to that, in, enjoy applying to business school, right? It's easy to get lost in the test scores you need to provide and the selectivity of these top schools. But boy, what a wonderful opportunity to step back from that busy day job that you have and really think about, you know, where you want to be in the next five years and what matters to you. Yeah, I was thinking about it when Colleen was, was talking earlier. The self-reflection that comes with just engaging the question of, do I want to go back to school? What do I want to do? You know, what is my career path? It's tremendously valuable, even if you ultimately decide not to pursue an MBA. There's so much value in that, the clarity of purpose, the sense of where you're going, all of that. Um, so, you know, one of the many ancillary benefits of applying to, applying to business school, but um, I wholeheartedly agree with Matt. 
enjoy this. It is, I mean, you can go to networking receptions, you meet fantastic people, expand your own personal network, even if you don't pursue an MBA. There's a lot to be gained. Great. Okay, another couple of questions for the panel. Yes. Hi there. Um, I actually work for the federal government, uh, as is probably more typical than usual in other parts of the country. Um, and in my role, I serve as an analyst, uh, so doing a lot of analytical work, uh, working as a part of teams, working as a part of some solo projects. Uh, but what I feel that I might be lacking in, in terms of my present experience, is leadership experience. Uh, I, I haven't even done anything like lead an informal project team. Uh, those are, it's a very, I suppose, hierarchical uh, organizational structure. It doesn't give, afford me that many opportunities to do that. Um, so how, how would you um, view a candidate like that who doesn't have as much formal leadership experience? Is, are there some ways you can see uh, pursuing leadership opportunities outside of the professional setting that might be helpful uh, for an applicant? Um, something like that? It's one of those big words, leadership. Where, where, where do you find it and, and, and how does it emerge? Colleen, do you want to start with that? Yes. Um, the leadership component is important in your application, but what we're looking for is your leadership potential. So if that's achieved through work projects, it's great. But anything that you're doing in your free time, anything you've done in your past that shows us that you could be potentially a future leader is important for us to know about. So. Again, it's always about the holistic view of who you are, who you are as a person. At least this is how HEC will analyze your profile and how we'll look at your candidacy to the program. Um, so maybe that means that you started a biking club and you're the leader of it. Maybe that means that you give classes on the weekends um, to underprivileged children. I mean, all of those things that you're doing in your, in your spare time are important and valuable. So we want to know about that because it, show, it shows us who you are. It shows us how you think. It shows us if you're a go-getter, if you take initiatives, it doesn't mean that you have to be involved in you know, 5,000 activities, but what we're looking for are keys that show us whether or not you are, um, whether you could become a very good leader. Brett, you're nodding. Yeah, I, I agree completely with everything that Colleen said. The other thing I would say is, as an admissions committee, I don't think we're overly prescriptive necessarily in what we're looking for from a candidate. I think we come to each application and say, well, who is this person? And and the imaginative piece of it is, well, who will this person be here at Darden? You know, how will you ultimately shape your classmates' learning experience? That sort of two-way street of it all. What will you contribute? What will you, what will you gain? Um, and you know, I think that is the nice thing about this, this particular job, uh, is that you get to learn about a lot of really interesting people, and you get to hear a lot of people's stories. I think everybody would tell you, uh, interviewing, just spending time with all of you and hearing why you arrived at this decision and what you hope to, hope to achieve. Tremendous privilege, it's also incredibly, incredibly rewarding. Mm. I, I just add to that, I have a, a colleague at Fortuna who used to work at Harvard Business School, a school that has a, a, a near obsession with leadership uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, she worked on a project that tried to develop a matrix of leadership and all of the different nuances that that, uh, and of course you've got Elon Musk waving his arms at the front of the stage talking about visionary space travel, um, but helping one of your colleagues you know, Stanford talks about changing lives and changing the world. It, it can be one life that you empower, whether that's through mentoring, whether that's through someone that you reach out to at work to help them to do a better job. So, you know, the schools, I think, you know, it's not prescriptive as, as you say, but absolutely. So I think we've got time for one more question before you actually get to uh, meet all of the schools that are with us tonight. John, do you have one final question for our panel? <sighs> One of those big questions that you ask, like, you know, is the MBA worth it? But you know the answer to that one. You think it's one of the best investments that people could make. Right. So, um, let me see. Yeah, this is on. Uh, so, if I apply at my age, would I be able to get in? You don't have to answer that one. <laughs> oh, no, no, publicly. <laughs> So just think, I, all right, so let's, let's go. So thinking a little bit about your work experience, your background, your profile, I think for us, we would think about our executive format. So to Colleen's point earlier about, or Matt's point as well, about finding your fit and thinking a little bit about who you're learning with and what you bring to the classroom. Uh, certainly at, at Darden, uh, we are imagining who you're going to be in that case discussion. And it's critical for you to be with people that are really your developmental peers. 
and that will that are at a common share set of experiences. You know, they've they've kind of come up at a certain point. Our average student in in the executive formats has about 11 to 12 years of work experience in the in the full-time MBA format. It's around four to five. Uh, it doesn't tell you the full story of the class because there's a range, um, but certainly with some. One like John, uh, we would say executive formats, which would be our, our working professionals program. The journalist side work, of him, he's going to write a pretty good application. Serious question. Because applications are down, does that mean it's easier to get into an, um, a highly ranked MBA program? Actually, Colleen, we'll start with you where applications are up. up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yes, actually, um, I'm glad you asked that question because I think in our case um, in, in Europe where we see an influx of applications, it's important not to self-select out of this process because you never know unless you try. Um, when I speak with someone and they're asking me, is my GMAT score good enough to get in? Is this good enough to get in? How is my CV? I mean, you have to try. Um, get to know the schools that you want to target. So if one of them is HEC Paris, then get to know us and then we'll be able to sort of guide you and help you see if it could be the right fit, right? Um, but yeah, I, I, I I do think that it's important to see yourself as an individual and always think about what you can bring to the program. Um, because you're an individual and you're going to be joining the program, you're eventually going to be an alumni of that program, HEC Paris MBA alumni. Um, so this, you know, it's something I think that you should try to envision yourself forward and think positively forward about um, your chances of, of, of getting in. Don't focus too much on the numbers. Don't focus too much on, oh, the average GMAT is 690, the average, you know, the average A's, I'm, I'm not old enough. Just think about it as your own particular journey. You don't have to fit a mold. We're not looking for you to fit a mold. We're not looking for you to have a certain discourse. We just want to know about you. So it's really, it's really more about that and your own personal um, project. So I think when you're coming forward with a strong application, that's when you're going to have good chances for admission, when you feel that your application is the strongest based on you. So applications may be down at some of those top U.S. schools, Brett, but is, is that just froth on the top of the pool? Well, what I will say is it's still extremely competitive, right? And so, as I mentioned at the, the outset, we are still seeing really strong candidates. But that said, um, again, it's not about the numbers. It's, it, at, at the end of the day, when you sort of, the numbers get you in the mix, you know, interview who you are as a person will ultimately sort of, you know, that's what we're really thinking about. And so, thinking about it, you know, okay, if applications are down, maybe it is a good time to apply, um, but understand that you're still going to have to really put together a compelling application. Um, there, I mean, you look at the opportunities that are, exist right now at MBA programs, all that you can accomplish, you know, everything that's being built out in service of the student experience, whether it's global experience, the scholarship opportunities, all this kind of stuff, it is a tremendous time to apply to business schools. But that said, you still have to you know, really think deeply about why you want to do this, why you want to come to this specific school, you know, why ultimately you want to pursue this career path, or what do you want to accomplish or achieve. Um, all of that is, is still the same. Competitive process, but great time to apply. Right. Now, of course, uh, John and I are both in our uh, mid-twenties, so uh, we've got plenty of time to think about this. Um, I think there's one underlying message. As we, you know, we started this panel talking about geopolitical uncertainty, it's a good place to be talking about that subject. We talk about Brexit, we talked about financial markets. Um, the MBA, whatever its format, you're investing in yourself. And isn't that the best place that you could invest? Well, you've all invested by uh, joining us at uh, the Centre Court, uh, whether on the live stream or uh, here in person uh, at the presidential suite at the Union Station. Uh, so enjoy the next couple of hours taking that investment the next step further, talking to Colleen, talking to Brett, talking to the other school representatives that you've had with us. Hope that you have a great evening, and thanks everyone for, for joining us. Thank you.